you know what is interesting about this episode today? Uh, we have done, I reckon, maybe 600 episodes of Private Parts. Maybe a surprise to you if you've ever listened to it. I've never prepared anything for any episode. Really? Yeah, I've never prepared anything. I don't believe that. I, I promise I would, I'm promise you, I've never prepared anything. And um, Ed, today uh, I, I slightly looked at some notes. Uh-huh. <laughs> I slightly went over some different things. And actually, um, for the past week, since I knew that we're having you on, I looked at all your interviews, all your YouTube channel, your podcast, whatever it was. And um, before we start, I just want to say I admire you so much oh. because of your patience. Thank you, Jeremy. That you have in these situations. It's, it's even now when you sit here, you're waiting for me to finish where I would talk over someone straight away. Sure. Where does that patience come from? I think that's from? just common politeness. Yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, where, you're you're just a rude ass. All right, shit. Shut up, you wankers. All right. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I was trying to be nice. Where does that patience come from? I think it's practice. Um, I'm very, I'm very aware that when I talk about issues like veganism, of course, it's, it's a hot topic and people are very opinionated about these issues Mm -hmm. and people have a lot of views about them. Um, And so I, I, I'm hyper aware that if I don't respect people and don't listen to them and don't give them a chance to express themselves, then the conversations I have are just going to end up in arguments and they're not going to get anywhere and it's all going to be pointless because, you know, people have this impression of vegans, whether it's right or wrong, that we're, militant and dogmatic and extreme and all of these things. I used to think the same thing. So when I have conversations, I'm very much of the impression I don't want to perpetuate that idea of vegans. So that's where it comes from. I guess it's like the same with environmentalists as well. If you, if you go in too hard with someone, it almost pushes, it pushes them the other way. And then, you know, you're not going to even meet in the middle ground. They're going to go, well, fuck off. Like, exactly. If you're coming at me aggressive, like, so I, I can see why you've had to pick up that patience. Definitely. It is a work in progress, you know, work in progress. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes someone will say something and I'll think, well, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. You know, people, <laughs> yeah. honestly, when it comes to veganism. Clench, some, clenching, <laughs> <laughs> clenching your fist. Internal <laughs> yeah. fury, but I'm, and I'm totally calm. I want to see in your home life where you just go nuts. <laughs> break just it, smashing really. cabbages. Just punching <laughs> pillows. <yeah. laughs> yeah. But um, Ed, so Ed, your name is Ed Winters. Your nickname or your kind of sort of um, name that you run by is Earthling Ed. And for people, a lot of people know who you are. I know who you are. Alex knows you are. The team here all know who you are. But for people who don't know who you are, can you explain your beautiful story that you have about your journey and where you got to where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously I'm vegan now and my life's work, if you like, is revolving around, you know, talking about veganism, spreading the message, trying to influence people's behaviors towards veganism. But I wasn't born in a, in a vegan family. Sometimes people have this impression that to be vegan means that you must have been raised in a family that were at least sympathetic towards it. But mine weren't and, and still kind of a little bit more iffy about it, right? So I was raised just eating meat, dairy and eggs every single day, never questioning it. And then in 2014, I came across this story. And it's a sad story, but it was a poignant moment in my life because the story was about a truck carrying around six and a half thousand chickens. And the truck had crashed on the way to a slaughterhouse near Manchester. Mm. And I remember reading this story and feeling very horrified because the journalist was describing what had happened to these chickens. Hundreds were dead, hundreds more were running into oncoming traffic. And for the first time in my life, I ended up sympathizing with chickens, which whoever does that, right? No no one sympathizes with chickens. Mm. And yet I'm 18, 19 years old, thinking about these chickens and going, oh, hang on a minute, something's wrong here. Um, But KFC was my favorite food back then. I loved KFC. Um, I used to go twice a week. The workers at my local KFC knew my name. So I had this little bit of rapport with my local KFC workers. And then all of a sudden I'm feeling sorry for these chickens who I was eating twice a week, sometimes Mm. three times a week. So I reached kind of, pardon the pun, but like a fork in the road. And I realized that my values and my actions weren't in alignment. Now in Britain, we are you know, proudly a nation of animal lovers. We always talk about that. And I, I was, I'm the same and I was the same. I always thought, you know, people that harm animals, that's a terrible thing to do. But then I thought, well, hang on a minute. Am I inadvertently through my choices harming animals? And so I went vegetarian. And then I watched a, a documentary called Earthlings, hence where the name Earthling Ed comes from. And the documentary just, I mean, it's not a nice watch. It's an objectively very graphic, horrible watch of what we do to animals. And afterwards I was feeling very upset and I had a little pet at the time called Rupert, Rupert the hamster. And so I went and sat with Rupert the hamster after this film had finished and I was looking at him and Rupert the hamster loved broccoli. It was his favorite food, absolutely loved it. So I got him some broccoli from the fridge, gave him a little bit of 
the florid. Did, did you cook it or is this just, <laughs> just straight, raw. straight raw? He's, he's like super, he, yeah. well, he was super healthy. Super vegan, raw yeah. vegetables yeah. only, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. So I gave Rupert some of this, this uh, broccoli and I watched him munch away on it. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, Rupert has all these likes and dislikes. He also hated kale, right? What sort of hamster doesn't like kale? I thought, you know, that would be a staple, but he didn't like it. And so I was thinking about him having these likes and dislikes and this personality. Mm. And I just thought about all the other animals and how they have likes and dislikes and personalities. And we use this word sentient to describe them. Sentient mm -hmm. meaning conscious, you know, having the capacity to experience, to feel, mm -hmm. to have emotions, both positive and negative. And then I thought, what about the animals who I pay to be exploited on my behalf? Should mm -hmm. they be factored into my moral consideration? And that, that's what led me to veganism, ultimately. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing story. And um... And, and one which I, I always admire people when they're passionate about things, whatever that is, it doesn't matter if it's water skiing, veganism, or going to the gym. If you have a passion, I think it's amazing. And you're obviously incredibly passionate about it. But you obviously are, you know, you're faced with a lot of opposition. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah a lot of the time, right? And, and rightly or wrongly, you are. Now, in this conversation we're going to have today, right, I, I'm probably going to say things that are stupid. And if I do, tell me that they're stupid. Or sure. if I say things, and I, I like kind of... Um, having a debate about this, because you have to be sort of, conf not confrontational, but you have to get into these debates. Have you always been someone who likes debating? No, no. no I, I hate confrontation. Really? Yeah, because yeah, you, now, you're now known for almost being confrontational where you turn up to radios, rodeos, yeah. or you go to, um, you know, f farming gatherings and things like that. And you question these people who are there. But if you're not used to that and you shy away from that, that's quite a hard thing to change as well. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I don't like confrontation. I don't really like arguing with people. And I think interesting that that's probably led me to kind of more of this stuff that I do now, like these table debates where I go mm. to universities and just set up a table and invite conversations because I just want people to, I just want to have a friendly conversation. Now, I, I like it's people. It's quite hard to get punched uh, over the other side of a table. You've, <laughs> got, you've, got, you've got a little bit of a leeway. <laughs> At rodeos, it's a little bit more, you know, <laughs> they live a little, more, a little bit more violently by nature, don't they, over there? Um, so, yeah, I think it was just a, a case of me wanting to. Be with, I like people. I'm a people person and mm -hmm. I like interacting with people. I enjoy people's company, even people I don't know. And so having these conversations about veganism, I really like it because I get to know people and mm -hmm. I get to know people's feelings and beliefs and values and I get to pick up on their behaviors. And I just really enjoy that aspect of what I do. And, and so it's not, I try to avoid the confrontation aspect of it, but undeniably there's always going to be confrontation when talking about big, you know, moral issues, which of course this is so yeah it does happen but, but it but, it, but it's, it's funny because i then watched this um one where you did it was a hunter versus a vegan and it was this lab, lab bible thing and you're actually quite uh, kind towards the hunter because hunter actually in my opinion didn't quite know what they're talking about and you always encouraged the conversation it was almost like a teacher trying to help her answer your questions like answer your questions you were helping along so i suppose which you probably never been asked because people sort of attack you and maybe sometimes they would think that you attack them if you were going to argue against yourself is there anything that you can possibly think that you would go, oh, okay, this is the argument against veganism? I thought about this a lot. I always try and do like the stress test with my arguments. Yeah, because you know? that's a good way to test things, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, I, I always think that the, the thing I feel most sympathetic towards people about when it comes to this issue is people's accessibility, you know? And I think that obviously veganism is an issue because it's now, we, we now have a choice, you know, we mm. have the option to be vegan or not vegan. Whereas in the past, we didn't necessarily have the option to choose plant-based foods because they yeah. weren't as available, weren't as, access, as accessible. So I always think that we need to strive to make veganism consistently more accessible, more available for people, you know, the plant-based substitutes more affordable. So in terms of an argument, there's no moral argument that I, I, could, I have found so far that goes against veganism, but a, a societal argument would be that we still need to make it more available and accessible for everyone in society. Mm. If, you know what I mean by that? Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean, but I think that's hard. Some people believe that being a, being vegan is like an elitist point of right. view, right? It, because it, it, it's, it's hard uh, to become, it's expensive. It's, um, it's a definitely, a, a, it's, it's a way of life. I was listening to your podcast with Jay Shetty and, you know, we, there are all the things and you can mention them much better than me that the sort of, when you become vegan, you have to be careful about, you know, your iron intake. Um, you have to be careful about your zinc and, mm -hmm. and things sure. like that. And there are supplements you can take. However, you're, you're having to take these pills or supplements. You, there's something called chrono, which you mentioned, or um, where you can judge the calcium levels. Oh, chronometer. Chronometer, exactly. So you're living a life. It, it's, it's a way of life. Well, it's a lifestyle choice, but so is eating meat, dairy, and eggs. And I think what I like about veganism is there is this attitude of scrutiny about it. 
So when we talk about nutrients, you know, iron and zinc, you should be aware of, but you don't need to supplement iron and zinc. You can get them from plants easily enough. So it's just a process of education. And even with that point about it being expensive, you know, sure, if you want to live off Beyond Meat burgers, that's going to cost more mm. than, you know, buying cheap beef burgers. But at the same time, you can also afford very cheap vegan foods like, you know, fruits and vegetables and brown rice and pastas and potatoes and lots of staples, which are also the healthiest foods, you know, incidentally yeah. as well. So you can be an expensive vegan, but you can also be a vegan on a budget. Mm. Um, and nutrients wise, you just have to be educated. But I think the, the trap that we fall into is thinking that if you eat meat, dairy and eggs, therefore you're getting all the nutrients. But actually many people are nutrient deficient when they eat meat, dairy and eggs, because yeah. we're just not educated enough about where these nutrients come from in the first place. I, th I think it's quite interesting placing veganism in like modern culture, like placing it against this ultra meat heavy world that we've lived in and looking at maybe at what like the history of veganism was and, and how that existed previously. Yeah. Do you know, do you know much about like kind of where the first sort of the idea of, of living a vegan lifestyle kind of came from? Well, it depends how you, it depends how you define veganism. Obviously throughout history, there have been cultures and communities who have abstained from eating meat. And, yeah. you know, we look at Jainist cultures and Buddhist cultures, Hindu cultures, but in terms of like vegan being uh, an ethical philosophical stance, it kind of really emerged in the early 20th century in the UK, a guy called Donald Watson mm -hmm. was part of the vegetarian society. And he said, well, hang on a minute, you know, what about dairy and eggs? We should, we should do something. And the society, the vegetarian society said no. So he created his own society and called it veganism because he took the veg from vegetarian and then the A and the N from the end of it and said, mm. let's cut out the middle and just go straight for vegan. So that's kind of where it originated in terms of being like an ethical philosophical stance, not yeah. just a religious thing, but saying, I'm not going to eat animal products because of this moral, um, I guess, in, you know, the moral implication of continuing to harm animals, if you like. Yeah, I guess, I guess because when you, as I was talking about contrasting it to, to modern society, it does seem like kind of an extreme thing to do. But actually, if you were to go back, you know, hundreds of years, it wouldn't maybe be seen as extreme because I feel like we as humans have taken, th as we do with everything, we've yeah. pushed everything to the limit. And, and I think, you know, veganism in its current form has maybe been born out of a recognition that we're kind of fucking everything up. The the way that we farm everything, the way that we do everything is is yeah. just so detrimental. Yeah. Also, I think we should probably lay out our stances where we Please, are. Yeah, because yeah, that's it. So I so I I would call myself a flexitarian. Sure. Okay. I mean that's basically saying like you're that's not, not you're, that's not what people call you behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> just to let you know. It's, it's true. <laughs> uh, you know, I have a sweet company, Candy Killings. We're completely vegan. The reason why we became vegan is because we wanted to make the best sweet possible. And we thought, yeah, for the cash. <laughs> and we thought, Probably. Yeah, yeah, we thought, but we thought removing um, animal gelatin, uh, all the sort of bad ingredients that, that was making it a better product. And so that's what we wanted to create. I haven't removed meat totally from my life for, for, sure. uh, Mainly down to pleasure, I would say. Sure. Sensual pleasure, right? This is sensory pleasure. This is the one that and this is the one that we can talk about as well. Um and Alex, you're the kind of same, I would say, that you sort of flex between the two. I mean, I, I'm probably further towards vegetarianism and veganism. I rarely eat meat, like I probably eat it like But you eat fish, right? I eat fish, yeah, a, a bit, not loads. Not loads. See, I, I, I don't eat red meat hardly ever. Mm. I eat chicken, I eat a lot of fish. Sure. Fish is fish is my main source of diet, I would say. And it would struggle to cut out. My, my sort of thing is this, you're saying it's, uh, it's far, farming is ruining land. So th this is my, my point that I want to try and stress. And also I'm, I'm just here. I, I don't have a view. I'm, I'm more excited for you to educate me. Sure. Yeah. Right. But I think it's important in these situations to possibly throw in a debate rather than just one siding stuff. Right. Oh, I, well, you know, that's what I do. That's what you do. So yeah. get ready for you to be beaten. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> get, owned. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here we go. Jay, I can't wait for okay. your, uh, your input. Here, okay. But it's true. Okay. So the, the point is, is right. Um, okay. If we look at farming, for example, sure. What you want to do is you, you want to educate farmers to sort of change the way that they farm and to, to do farming crops rather than, um, farming animals and things like that. That's the sort of idea and educating them towards that. When you, when farmers farm a field, right, when they sort of surf it or whatever it is, they, um, the amount of field mice that are killed, the amount of bugs, the amount of maggots within uh, cow pats um, are in the, but well, it's true, it's within the thou thousands. Mm -hmm. So, and if a farmer then sends his, you know, his cows in the pasture to uh, slaughter, that's maybe hundreds or whatever it is. So, it, so the amount of bugs and, field mice and things that are being killed when a field is being sown is far more, it seems like. So where does the arbitrary line stop? Is, is a cow more important than a bug because you can see it and feel it and 
understand it and touch it and it produces milk. So where is the line? Does that make I, sense? I, I, I kind yeah. of have two things to be. Okay, okay go. Sure. I, was that total nonsense? Or was the, that no, a, no, no. That's actually a very educated, very sensible argument. Great. Okay, um, we're in. So let's see how we can deal with it. So I think the first thing to consider is, well, the field mice one is a little bit of a, a red herring. You know, if you try and catch a mouse, they're going to get away from you. So a big combine harvester coming across the field, most of the larger mammals, you know, the, the rodents as well, and the birds are going to clear off pretty quick. But the insects is absolutely true. Of course, insects are going to get, you know... Um, yeah, they're going to get macerated by a lot of this equipment. But at the same time, what we have to consider is that animals who we farm are also fed crops as well. Even grass-fed animals who are out in pastures are often supplemented with things like hay and silage, which is basically grass that's grown in fields and then, um, you know, harvested and dried and then used as food. So when you look at land usage, the majority of the land that's used is used for animal farming, even when it comes to, to cropland, for mm. example, as well. So even if we make the argument that all these insects are killed, well, they're more still killed for the animals who we consume because the animals who we consume are also fed plants as well. And I think when you said about cows, you said you said hundreds. Well, it, it's millions in the UK alone, mm. billions when we look around the world. So actually more, more insects are also killed in the production of, of plant foods for animals than they are plant foods for humans. But beyond that point, I think what you... I think the interesting thing of what you said there is how do we rank life? Mm. That to me is a mm. really profound and great question. Now, for me, I look at life and I base a moral consideration on sentience, that word I used earlier. Mm. And so if I put it into a perspective or into like a, um, a scenario for us, you know, you may have heard this in, in one of the interviews I've done recently, but let's say we have a burning building and in that burning building, you have a human and a dog and you can only save one life in that, in that building. Did you say dog? Okay. All right. Well, many people might do. it was do. Jay, yeah. 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 I'd probably the save dog. the cockroach. <laughs> but typically people would say typically the human, say, right? Yeah. Typically they say the human. And so we, you could find reasons why that would be morally justified, right? But like, the point in that is it's not just then justified to harm a dog normally. So we can create distinctions on life based on things like sentience. So let's say that we have a situation where, where there's a cow or an aphid or a green fly or whatever it is in a burning building. We'd opt to save the cow because we recognize that the cow has the sentience, the capacity to experience emotions. Their life has more value to them than the, than the aphid does to the aphid. So you can mm. create distinctions. So if we had to choose between killing you know, animals like cows, pigs and chickens or killing insects to farm them for crops, even outside of the context of more insects being killed for, for animals currently, even outside of that context, you could still find the moral distinction that makes killing the insects worthwhile, you know, more morally justified than killing yeah. the animals we currently kill to conventionally consume. Yeah, but, but does that I, argument work? I, because I, then you're still picking, you're still picking sides, right? We have, to, right? Eat. I, we have I, to eat and we can't live a morally puritanical life. Yeah, and so what we have to, to do achieve. is choose a, a way of life that reduces suffering the most. That's the important this, question. This is what I, was gonna say. I think it needs to stop being so black and white. And it's, I mean, it's maybe a slightly utopian way of looking at things, sure. but it's like about readdressing just our respect for animals, for nature, for everything. And in doing so, we will minimize death and there will be less of a deficit. I, I don't know why um, I'm, I'm sticking to this. I, and also, I, 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 I'm not... I'm, I'm, I have a vegan company, right? I'm, sure. I'm, I'm for veganism, yeah. but I just think it's important because it, it's just important to have this conversation, but we, we, we want to educate people. And I think you use that word the whole time, educating people and what we can do differently and yeah. how we can help things, you know, but if you look at sort of, um, you know, farming cultures or farming industries or, or farming families that have done it for generations, that's the only thing they know. Sure. What you're doing, uh, you're asking them to completely change their business model. And if you go to someone like Dyson and say, okay, we don't want you to do any fans anymore. We want you to start selling swimming pools. They wouldn't be able to do it. So therefore they would be out of, jo out of jobs. So I don't think you can educate people to farm things differently because it's actually pivoting a complete business. But it's not as much of a pivot as the example yeah. you used there. What we have is a situation where we farmers are, they're basically meant to be stewards of the land. You know, that's their primary focus. You know, stewarding land and providing for human society. That's, that should be what their aim is. But what we have right now is an industry that's not stewarding the land, is, is it's ravaging. Monoculture farming is just like basically destroying everything because it's not natural to have yeah. one crop over like, you know, millions of hectares of land i mean even just recently it's, it's terrible for the soil it like it takes all actually also takes all of the carbon out there's a really good documentary yeah it with, takes out the nitrogen and things like that yeah, of the land. so yeah. we're not putting back enough nutrients I, there's in, a right? really good documentary about this california couple that um they move out of the city and they want to set up a farm so they they get the specialist who is a polyculture specialist sure. and they basically speak to a lot of farmers in it and the, the argument is that actually if you can create this harmony this polyculture harmony where you've got all of these different you know crops and, and animals all living in a particular space it actually kind of it works for itself and also 
you can, it, it's more profitable. And you also set, you know, you back yourself because if, if for example, you've only got one crop and there's, there's a drought or there's, um, you know, disease, then your, your year is fucked. Whereas if you've got 30 different crops, you're kind of like, you know, you're covering your backs. Um, so they're saying that if, if, if they can revert to a more sort of, you know, ancient way of farming, which is this polyculture way of doing it, then it will be a lot more profitable. Yeah. It's just trying to get out of these, these old models of, of well, so newer models of yeah. doing things where they have to spray so much, um, but you're, so, you're, so, so much, uh, you know, pesticide. pesticides and stuff to keep the crops going because they, they've just ravaged the land so much. But, but then what you're telling, you're, you're telling people to change a whole culture. <laughs> Which, well, which is not necessarily. I mean, it's about this notion of suffering. And so I think what we have is a situation of farming where it's maximizing the suffering that's caught, being caused, but not for any great benefit for us. In fact, the detriment of our species with the environmental degradation mm. that comes as a result. Now, I think that there is this idea that vegans want all animal farmers to switch to plant farming, but that's not, that's not strictly the case because the last thing we need is to take all the farmland that's currently used for, for animals and grow plants on it. We, we don't want to do that. Mm. What we want to do is something called rewilding the land. So rewilding means taking farmland that's currently used and returning it back to nature. So that could be reforesting, um, you know, creating peatlands, wetlands, uh, wildflower meadows, long grass pastures, whatever it may be. And so what we can do is we can incentivize farmers who are currently grazing animals on this land to instead return that land back to nature. Now, what we have to bear in mind is we subsidize farmers by billions, with billions of pounds every single year. Explain that a little bit more. Absolutely. So subsidies are taxpayers' money. So when we give, you know, when we pay our taxes, a portion of that money is given to certain industries. It's given to fossil fuel companies. It's also given to the agricultural industry as well. Mm. And the purpose of that is to drive down the cost of production so that we can maximize the amount of food that we produce and make it cheaper and more affordable to produce as a consequence, cheaper for the consumer. Um, but what we have is a system now where we're subsidizing farmers so much that 90% of the profits of grazing animal farmers, that's cattle farmers, sheep farmers, 90% of their profits is coming from the taxpayer. And, and those products are still expensive to buy in a supermarket. So this mm. is not an economically viable system without the help of the taxpayer. So what we need to do, in, in my eyes, is still subsidize these, these farmers but give them the money they're currently given to rewild that land. You know, rewilding increases biodiversity. It means we can absorb carbon, sequester carbon from the atmosphere because we've got trees and, you know, wildflowers that are good for pollinators and all of these things. And so when we talk about changing culture, we're not asking farmers to no longer live on their land. We're not asking them to move into cities and work in supermarkets or any of that. We're asking them to keep living off the land, but do so in a better way for all of us, which undeniably a system that's more focused on nature than on production I, must I, be. I can imagine a lot of the farmers would actually probably welcome it because it sounds like the industry is really struggling to yeah. keep up. Like if, if 90% of their profits are coming from, from subsidies, yeah, then yeah, it's, yeah, obviously, it's obviously an industry that's not working, right? Yeah. But, but, but people are stuck in their ways, right? It's very Absolutely. hard. And, of and course. That's, and yeah. that's how they, you're stuck in your way. I'm stuck. You're stuck in your way. We are stuck in our ways. And it's very hard to create that shift. Absolutely. Hard. Yeah. From your side, Ed, okay. Did you become vegan because your love for animals or was it because you couldn't justify why killing animals was right in any way? Yeah, people have this idea, I think, that to be a vegan means you have to have this compassion towards animals that's almost unnatural or abnormal, you know, yeah. or you must really like animals. The truth is, I don't think I, I, I know lots of people who like animals who say they would more than I do. You know, I don't like snakes, but I don't want people to just go and harm snakes. So for me, veganism isn't an issue of, of compassion. It's an issue of, of justice. And so mm. what I mean by that is if we leave today, this podcast studio, and we go out for a walk and we come across a dog and we don't kick that dog, that's not us being compassionate. So in the same way that if I can avoid putting a pig in a gas chamber or paying for a cow to have their throat cut, I don't view that as compassionate because I think it's just the right thing to do from a justice perspective, not to put someone, you know, a sentient being into a situation where they don't have to be placed into that undeniably causes them harm and suffering and, and robs them of their, their life. It's a culturally learned behavior to view some animals as being food animals, some as being pets. So, you know, we, we do have this, you know, paradoxical attitude mm. towards different animals when morally a dog's capacity to suffer and feel love and all these things is, is more or less the same as the pigs, at least in a way that makes you know, them both morally relevant. So it is an arbitrary cultural distinction that we've created. It's not grounded in anything that makes any real sense because for, you know, for one animal, we love them as a family member. We mourn them when they die. We, we, mm. you know, we, we grieve their loss. But then for another, we you know, raise them in farms where we mutilate them 
We put, you know, mm. mother pigs in, in things that we call farrowing crates that they can't even turn around in for weeks at a time. And then we kill them in gas chambers. You know, over about 90% of all the pigs in the UK are killed in gas chambers. Wow. You know, so what is the moral distinction between a dog and a pig that makes that acceptable for a pig, but the, you know, not acceptable for a dog? I think, I think, I think um, going back to the compassion thing, I think a lot of us are still very compassionate. I think it's just the fact that it's so dislocated, like people don't know or see this. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And if right. they saw it on a daily basis and they saw the pigs being treated that way, they would probably stop. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's just because it's presented to you as like, people this, don't this, choose this to, though, delicious, thing. And, it's uh, very easy to, to not, right? Yeah, yes. but people, people choose not to, right? That's the whole point. There's actually like a syndrome, I think, where people actually choose to deny that thing because if they, they know if they actually saw it, then they wouldn't actually approach the situation. Yeah. It's, it's like willful ignorance, isn't it? Yes, We exactly. maybe deep down mm. think, oh, you know, you know, maybe I shouldn't be supporting this. But as you say, there's labels and there's adverts on TV and we've been raised to believe it's normal and acceptable and fine. So we don't want to dig any deeper and go, hang on a minute, you know, should I be paying for this to happen to an animal when I don't have to? Like, how do I justify, you know, paying someone to lower a pig into a gas chamber when I can buy something else instead? But that disconnection, as you say, Alex, so perfectly is what I think drives so much of this, mm. this industry. Oh my God. And honestly, I'm, I'm so psyched on this podcast. We're going to have to stop there for part one. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about your book. Yeah. Can't wait. We're going to talk about, I want to talk about uh, laboratory meat. Oh, you're good. Yeah, and nice. see your yeah. view on that and yeah. so many other things. Don't, you can't go anywhere. No, I'm, I'm stuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, <laughs> Stuck in the cage that we're in. Um, and we're all naked. So <laughs> we'll see you in part two. Okay. <laughs> okay. See you in part two. Bye bye. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to part two of Private Parts. We're still here with Ed Winters. Um, okay, Ed, you have your book out at the moment as well. It's called Vegan Propaganda. Yeah. Um, this is vegan propaganda. This is vegan and propaganda. And other lies the meat the industry other, tells yeah, you. I saw it on the tube. It's, it's amazing. The, the artwork's awesome. Um, as I said to you, great uh, marketing ploy. It's, it's out of the moment. That's so smart. Yeah. Veganery. What a great. Perfect time for a vegan book, right? Perfect timing. <laughs> Tell me about the book. Yeah, so the book basically um, outlines the reasons to be vegan and yeah. to eat a plant-based diet. So it looks at the ethical arguments, you know, some of which we've discussed. It looks at the environmental arguments, looks at some of the health arguments, and it looks at you know, things like pandemic risk, you know, the bird flu and swine mm. flu and how factory farming in particular creates these diseases, which as we know from current situation can be uh, globally problematic. So it talks about all of that and it talks about solutions as well. You know, some of what we discussed earlier about what, how do we help farmers? You know, what can we do to help them transition? Um, and basically it, in my eyes, it outlines the main reasons why I'm passionate about why I do what I do. And then it, you know, also discusses some of the, the psychological and social barriers. And we talked about disconnection earlier. We talked about some of these, you know, willful ignorance aspects of, of how we live. And so it addresses the problem and then it addresses kind of the drivers behind our behavior and then ends with the solutions. And what were you doing before? Nice. Before. Yeah, because honestly, I think what happens is when you go on... He was a cattle farmer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. He used to work on a ranch. Yeah. <laughs> but what do you do before? Because I think what happens is if people get you on... I, I feel I, I, I get irritated sometimes myself because I want you to come on a podcast and I want you to have different questions. And typically what happens is with you, I can imagine the same questions always fire at you, the same sort of situations. And I don't think people potentially get to know the real you mm. right? a lot mm. of the time. So what were you doing before all of this, before yeah. you decide to be a campaign and activist? I, I studied film and TV production at university and I had this uh, probably egotistical aspiration of being this hotshot movie director. Um, and that was my passion. I, lo I love films. So I, I loved, loved cinema. And so that's what I was doing beforehand was trying to pursue a career you know, working in film. Um, you know, I, I was toying with the idea of teaching film. I just wanted to work in the film industry. And then when I came, when I became vegan, this kind of snowballed very quickly. Um, and so you know, after I came out of university, this is what I kind of landed into pretty, pretty fast. Let's, let's take hunters, for example. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, do you believe hunters, hunters claim, right? And maybe, I, I don't know. I'm just saying hunters claim that they, what they do is they, they hunt, they hunt their own food, food. Joe mm -hmm. Rogan, for example, he hunts his own food and then he says he eats it for a year and things like that. And that's why he does it because, you know, he has this argument that, um, uh, animals are going to die a horrible death anyway. So he sort of makes it easier for these animals and then he can eat and he, it, it's for the the welfare of the animal and to feed his whole family. Do you think hunters are hunters because they get pleasure out of hunting or they actually are for 
uh, it's for the benefit of the animals. Oh, firstly, pleasure. I mean, I've I've watched Joe Rogan hunting videos and he expresses so much delight at at killing animals. I think the issue with hunting is, and and look, don't get me wrong. I don't think that hunters are are less moral or, you know, either way than people buying steak in a supermarket. You know, I think that factory farming causes more suffering than than hunting does. So I'm not trying to say, you know, I think people think hunting must be like the epitome of the the vegan bad guy, you know, but I I don't think that that's true. Um, But I do think that hunting, as we have come to understand that is wrong. Now, when we talk about the welfare of the animals, I could buy that if it was that they were going and looking for weak animals who are starving and then putting them down in, a, you know, euthanizing them in a, in a gentle way. But hunters specifically look for the biggest stags with the biggest antlers because that's the prized kill, you know? And I think that there is this disconnection between what hunters sometimes say they're doing and what they're actually doing. And you know, even when, when Joe says, well, I eat, I eat this elk for a whole <laughs> year, so that may be true, but you're not just eating the elk for the, for the whole year. You know, he still goes into restaurants and buys factory raised animals. He still goes into supermarkets and buys that. He just also hunts as well. Um, so I think it's not quite as black and white as that. Yeah, he's hiding behind it in a certain way and he, he's not in the real truth. No, I, I understand that. Okay, so the other the other example is, is that, you know, there's this lab meat being made, which yeah. is people are making meat in laboratories and they're, not, they're nearly at a place where actually this is going to be feasible. Yeah. Would you eat it? Yeah, I probably would. I'd, I'd at least try it because people sometimes think, well, if it's meat, it can't be vegan. But being vegan means trying to reduce animal exploitation, animal harm. So the problem with meat isn't the meat. It's what happens to get the meat. So if we can remove that whole process and just end up with a piece of meat at the end of it, then that's vegan because veganism is about abstaining from meat. It's about the harm that's caused to create it. So for me, I think it's an incredibly exciting thing. And I, I, I don't, there's no moral qualms in my mind to, to consume it. Okay, so then hear me out for this one. Please. Okay. And forgive me if, and, and please don't answer it if you don't these have are, to. These are not stupid questions at all, Jamie. Yeah, They're so, really not. So no, but this one is more about yourself. So I, I would, maybe I'm naive, but I would say that your job is what you do now. You're an activist. You, you get brought on debates and this is how you earn an income, yeah. right? And that's yeah. how you live. Yeah. And it's a great thing. You're passionate about it, which is the best thing. We want to, you know, um, something like 13% of Americans wake up in the morning and like their job. So <laughs> they, yeah, they love it, right? So one, 3%. So they yeah. wake up in the morning and go, God, I love what I do. 66% of Americans or 64% of Americans do something called sleep working. So they wake up in the morning, they just do their job, and then they go to bed that night. That's what happens. And the rest of 24, my maths, whatever it is, 23%, um, are depressed or anxious going to work. Right. And supposedly 36% of Americans have a negative impact on, on the business, right? So it's very rare to love what you do. Yeah. And I, I can very much say, in, in the most privileged point of view, that I wake up and I go, God, I love what I do. And I yeah. think Alex, you can do the same, and Ed, you can do the same. If we have laboratory meat, let's say, and all things are taken away and and... Let's say people aren't uh, are not eating any dairy products or, or or animal products whatsoever. You then become out of a job. Yeah. So is that almost a scary prospect? Is that you, uh, does that make you like a football goalkeeper? You don't want any goals going in, but also you want to have shots fired at you because you want to have a bit of play within the game. So is there a sort of hard thing there where you go, well, actually, I I, I do want everyone suffering to disappear. I want all these things to happen. But also at the same time, if all of that happens, then I'm almost out of a job. I would take that situation. Would you? It makes you feel like you'd be like mission complete. Like I can can relax. That's amazing. That's amazing because a lot of people, uh, and I actually truly believe you just think, because a lot of people would say that, but perhaps wouldn't actually want that to happen. I mean, this is what I wake up every day hoping will happen. And I'm not naive. I don't think that in my lifetime it, it, it will. I'm pretty sure that we'll make huge strides and, and you know, lab grown meat and such will probably become, you know, most probably become more prevalent than actual, you know, flesh from, a, from an actually uh, a killed animal. But at the same time, you know, that's what I strive for. I mean, this is why I get up every day. And if, if, if I could click my fingers and make it happen tomorrow, I absolutely hundred mm. percent would, you know, we're obviously clicking my fingers and making everything else fall into place as well. You know, the whole societal aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a no brainer. This is. That's it. That's amazing. So, so you're, you're, you're incredibly compassionate person. I mean, you, you, you are, you, you must be right to, to be the way you are and live the way you are and, and, and do the things that you do that that's almost a mantra. It takes practice, right? How do people become like that? Oh, well, it's very kind. I mean, it's true though. It's true. Yeah. It's, but it's the truth, right? It's, it's, more of a truth than a compliment it's meant to be but it does come off as a compliment well that's even even kinder of you to say i mean look it's it's a practice and it's a process as well 
you know, I went vegetarian before going vegan. And, you know, it's just something I, I built up to understanding over a little bit of time and, you know, took the time to think, well, where do I get my protein from? Where do I get my iron? Where do I get my calcium? So for me and that personal journey, it was just the process of education and then, and then making those swaps and realizing oh, I'm vegan now. And then I think how I view other people is I, like I said at the beginning, you know, in part one, I, I like people. And I think that maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm more idealistic than you, but I think that whilst we are driven by selfish tendencies and we are driven by almost sadistic or sociopathic desires at times, that is undeniable. I think deep down, we have the capacity to be really quite something special. You know, I think if we look at how much we are evolving, how much we're changing, mm -hmm. I think humans have the potential to really be stewards of this world and do a good job, you know, protecting others, including ourselves, of course. And so I, I just have hope for that. So I, I like people because when I connect with people and I speak with people, you know, we, we're not agreeing on, on everything mm -hmm. far from it. But I, I like you and I enjoy your company because I can see that you are a rationally motivated and compassionate individual as well. It's just we haven't come to the same life decisions ultimately yet. So that's why I view other people as, you know, I think we're all just trying to do good. And, I, you know, it's a bit pretentious maybe to say this, but I think, you know, Aristotle once said that, you know, bad people don't necessarily think that they're doing bad things. But I don't think that people doing bad things are necessarily bad people to begin with. You know, I don't think people buying meat, dairy and eggs makes them bad. I think we're good people mostly. But sometimes we do bad things because of cultural, you know, mm. ideas or because of normalization through our families and through the people around us. I think we are intrinsically able to do good. We just need to look through and, and understand where we are still doing bad. Mm. Is, is, uh, is there an argument to suggest that nature knows best? No. Nature's is it, violent and cruel. Do you think so? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, so, so break that down a little bit more. Well, nature knows best in terms of like a purely evolutionary survival process, you know, maximization of evolution. But in terms of like reducing suffering, nature is horrendously the opposite. It just maximizes suffering in so many so different true. ways. It actually does. Nature's actually, it really does. actually The so world really hates us. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Mother Earth is not so compassionate. <laughs> It's like that that mushroom that like infects wasps brains. Right, exactly. Yeah. I, Wait, I, I read, this? I read uh, reading Merlin Sheldrake's book about mushrooms. There's a mushroom that infects uh, cicadas. You know cicadas that make the the noise at night. They sound like crickets. Cicadas. Sh cicadas. <laughs> and it basically it um, decomposes just enough of their body on on the back end of their body so that they can still fly. And as they fly, they spread the fungal spores around. And apparently there's like amphetamines in the spores and all this stuff of shit. It's just like nature is so mad. Yeah, I saw this thing that, um, I saw Stephen Fry talk about the thing where there's, there's these insects that go behind children's eyes and yeah. eat their way out. I mean, and he, and he explains, he says, what type of God would do that? Yeah. Well, yeah. Why would God create that? Yeah. And then I saw another thing actually, which, and, and you know, like I'm not going to say if I'm not, I, I, Joe Rogan, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence, right? But he, he put something out there, which he shows that there was a, um, there's an insect that eats the tongue of a fish and then sits on the, then becomes oh, its tongue. Yeah, I saw that. Like nature is bizarre, right? Nature's, yeah, it's sadistic. But, but people would argue saying nature knows best. So throughout uh, centuries and years and since the beginning of time, we have been meat eaters. Yeah. That's what we've done. We've been yeah, born yeah. to that. We have our fingernails, we have our canines, we have our, our jaws are in certain ways. So, so we're then going against what nature has told us to do. And how would you argue against that? Well, I mean, I mean, firstly, from a biological perspective, you know, our canines are good for biting through apples and stuff as well. Pretty terrible for tearing through flesh. If you want a piece of, pick a piece of chicken and try and tear through it, you're going to struggle. So I don't think it's necessarily that these biological things we look to necessarily indicative of, you know, being this, you know, successful meat eaters. But at the same time, I think it's kind of beside the point. You know, we live in homes. We have medications. We have microphones to record podcasts because we enjoy listening to them. Nothing that we do is, is natural anymore. And yeah. actually society is a lot better for it. You know, we, we have medications to treat natural diseases. You know, people get anthrax, which is a natural disease. We take synthetic antibiotics to treat it. So it's not important what's natural. What's important is how do we create a better society? And for me, a better society is one that pursues the reduction of suffering. So mm -hmm. even if we have for all of our history, which most of us, you know, culturally speaking, have, you know, eaten meat and survived off meat and needed to eat meat to get to where we are, I'm not ever going to deny that. The point is now in a current context, is it beneficial for us? Is it helping us create this version of the world that we want to live in? Or is it stopping us from progressing? And I think it's holding us back from creating this world, which is ultimately more in alignment with the values that we say that we have. You know, if you ask anyone, are you against animal suffering? Are you against animal cruelty? Every single person will say yes, unless they're clearly psychopathic. And we think that's scary. 
So then the question becomes, how does what we do to animals, how does the fact that we raise billions, you know, trillions when we factor in marine animals, how does that suffering that we cause them and the unnecessary deaths that are inflicted upon them, how does that factor into our morals of saying that we're against animal suffering? You know, if kicking a dog is animal cruelty and makes you a bad person, then what does cutting the throat of a cow mean? What does, you know, putting a pig in a gas chamber mean? You know, the Olympics were just on and there was global outrage because someone punched a horse. Well, if punching a horse is, is worthy of global condemnation, then why isn't killing trillions of animals every single year? trillions? When you fact, yeah, it's, it's mm. 83 billion land animals and 0.8 to 2.3 trillion marine animals. That is mad. It's outrageous, isn't it? Outrageous. We, you can't even- <laughs> It's so it's, large, it's, you can't comprehend it. You can't it. quantify it. Like, no. I, like oh my. It's, it's, it's growing. I, I, it's not going down, you know? Is there a situation where we are worried about our marine life, where it's, it's going to run out? Well, it depends what you mean by run out. You know, fish stocks will, will collapse. Many fish stocks will collapse. And, you know, even fishermen themselves who have been fishing for generations, you know, their fathers and their grandfathers were bringing in much larger catches than, than they currently are themselves now because our oceans are being depleted. You mm. know, when we look at, um, you know, keystone species such as sharks and such that are very important in terms of oceanic health, their populations are being decimated, you know, 90% some species, of course. So there's this whole food chain that exists in the ocean. And when we remove certain species, we have an impact on the whole food yeah. chain that exists. So we are heading towards severely depleted oceans, which is a fundamentally catastrophic thing for us as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just take everything to extremes, don't we? Yeah. We literally, we find a good thing and we just push it so far. And, and I would argue yeah. that that is more often than not the, the chase of profit, right? Profit is what has has pushed these things to, to extreme. And it, it makes humans uh, turn away from their compassionate side and they go, well, you know, I need to make profit here. So it yeah. doesn't matter if I'm going to fuck up the, uh, fuck up the ocean. We're short-term thinkers, aren't we? Yeah, we yeah, we well, don't. We're totally short-term thinkers. We have, you know, in everything, you know, uh, there was this interesting thing that I saw about businesses. German business, 53% of German businesses still family run. Right. I mean, that's a kind of incredible statistics and hence why they're the third biggest like economy, right? right. In England, we uh, have this thing, which is like the third generation car curse. Uh, grandfather makes it, father loses it, son has to rebuild it. Right. We, we, especially in the UK, we are so about short term. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't look that long distance. If someone offered us a hundred pounds now, we'd take it rather than a thousand pounds in two years time. Right. I mean, and that's a really, a really bad way to be, I think. I think yeah. we've got to look out for our children. I mean, you'd hope that, you know, the, the way that society is so connected now, and we also have like such a wealth of, of you know, history, everything is stored. We might hopefully get this kind of collective you know, union where we all come together and we actually start to think about the long term because, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, humans were still living a very cyclical life where, you know, you live for 60 years and then that's your generation done and you're not necessarily thinking about the, the longer perspective. But I would argue now that we have the ability to, to think like that. So it'd be amazing if we did all like kind of come together and try and turn the situation around, I guess. Would be nice. And, yeah. And yeah, it would be are, nice. Are you religious? I'm not, no. You're not? No. It's interesting that you're so compassionate, but you're not religious because in, do you, because in a sense you would, you don't want suffering, but then if suffering is a way of life and then you just die and then that's it, there's nothing beyond. Well, I, I but I, what matters to me is what people and individuals and animals feel now, mm. you know, I, I, whether there's an afterlife or not, doesn't change the experience that someone's forced to endure now. Mm. Um, and for me, I don't need, you know, the fear of um, an afterlife of eternal suffering to motivate me to hopefully do good. You know, so I, the way that I see it is, you know, I'm, I'm look, I'm open minded, hopefully, at least I'm not saying that there's definitely nothing. But from my mind, my, my feelings are that what matters is, is what's present. Um, and so if I can reduce harm, regardless of what happens after someone is killed, then that should be my moral prerogative. So then if when you when you're in a rocking chair and you're 90 years old and you're looking back at your life. Yeah. What are you going to hope that you achieved and did? I just want to be a, a piece of the puzzle that created some significant change. You know, I just want to be a part of that. I just want to look back and say, at least I contributed to trying to do something beneficial. Because I think society is changing so quickly, so, so quickly, and not just with veganism, in so many different areas. Mm. And I think in the past 10 years, especially, we have started to have, we've started to have really confrontational conversations about so many different things, which is, is so beneficial and so important. And I think society is changing at a rapid rate. And I just think that when I'm 80, 90, however old I'm fortunate enough to live to, that I just look back and say, at least I tried to stand on the right side of, of that progress. And I wasn't yeah. trying to stop it. You'll probably live longer if you're vegan. Oh, well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Well, 20, maybe yeah. not with some of the processed <laughs> junk food I eat every time to time. Yeah. But that's the other thing, right? And I think a lot of people um, listening to you right now, 
And, you know, we have a fair amount of listeners who will be thinking, God, maybe I should do this. Uh, what would you say? Because typically, you know, vegan is uh, becoming vegan. You can be a bit stodgy, a bit unhealthy sometimes and okay. things like that. So, and you, you seem like, a, you, I mean, your skin is glorious. You, you're, you're, you're looking incredibly healthy. <laughs> So what would you say to people if they want to try it? Or, you know, it's yeah. very hard to suddenly go, right, I'm now vegan. That, that's it's like saying, let's run a marathon now. It's, yeah. uh, so how do you approach the situation, would you say? Oh, this is such a good question. And again, really good point you make, which is we shouldn't give ourselves like this ultimatum, right? Where we go from this moment on for the rest of my life, I'm going to be vegan. You know, psychologically, that's so scary, right? I remember when I first went vegan, I said to myself, I'll, I'll eat, you know, a cheeseburger again. I definitely will. Because it kind of gave me this space to think, you know, this isn't a lifelong commitment. Mm. You know, eventually I realized I don't want to eat, you know, a real animal cheeseburger again. So that was never When was the last time you ate meat? 2014, I think. Really? Yeah, been, Do you remember the day? A minute. No, I don't you remember don't the remember? day, no. But it's been a minute. Um, you know, it was just something that I, when I went vegetarian, it was just kind of this process of, you know, taking me out and then all of a sudden just being vegetarian. I can't, it wasn't like this pinpoint moment necessarily. It was this kind of like couple of weeks spell. And so for what I always say to people is take it day by day, you know, take it yeah. meal by meal, just prepare some meals. For, you know, I've got stuff for vegan breakfast, I'll have a vegan lunch, I'll have a vegan dinner and just do it meal by meal day by day. And then be educated, you know, look for some vegan recipes. There's, you know, Bosch are a great example of these two UK vegan chefs who are just great and do great, you know, plant-based food. Um, so look for definitely vegan recipes and vegan chefs online. And then also have a look at where you get your nutrients from, you know, do it just for your own peace of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, where do I get my iron from? Where do I get my calcium, my zinc, whatever it may be. And just take, just take a few hours out of your day over a couple of days, just to make sure that you feel fully comfortable knowing where you're getting everything from, and then just do it day by day by day. And if you make a mistake or on one day you slip up and order a Domino's, that's not the vegan Domino's because there are vegan, there is vegan Domino's now, but you get the other one. Just, you know, whatever, you've made a mistake, you just keep going. And I think we have this all or nothing attitude where if we slip up, we go, oh, well, there's no point me trying anymore. Yeah. So just sim simplify it down is what I always say to people. And you don't miss it. Uh, oh, gosh, no, no. You don't miss it. I remember I heard this thing you have... Um... Uh, Texan barbecue based pizza was that the that's the one you used to oh, yeah, yeah that, that you was have it. done your research yeah that yeah. was it right that was yeah. your favorite you don't miss that ever I do not know I mean look I would love a vegan version and and don't get me wrong I I enjoyed the taste of all these foods but the question which is something we alluded to at the beginning is I said you know does my sensory pleasure does my taste enjoyment justify the consequence of what buying these foods results in, you know, mm. everything that happens, the environmental damage, the animal suffering, if I can avoid that and still enjoy food, which I still enjoy food just as much as I used to, but just in different ways, is that not the morally right thing for me to do? So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that Domino's are going to have a Texan barbecue pizza, stuffed crust, extra cheesy. Of course, I'm hoping for that. But if it never happens, I'm totally fine with that as well, because the importance of making that choice is far higher than the taste pleasure I get from consuming those foods. I, I think, think I think we should tag them on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's get a let's petition. Get a petition. I, I, I think 100. And listen, um, I, I, dude, I honestly, I know how busy you are. I know how you're pulled from all different angles to be on different things, and I, I honestly can appreciate you more coming on this and educating me, educating the audience. And um, I love, I love your passion. Thank I, you. That for me, it doesn't, you know, having someone like I said at the beginning coming on has a passion. Where can we get your book? Yeah, so you can get it online, um, Amazon, Waterstones, Foils, or you can get it in bookstores. So Waterstones, Foils again, or independent bookstores are stocking it. Um, and if your independent bookstore doesn't, then you can ask them and they'll, they'll buy it is in there for an, you. Is there an audio book? There is. There's an the audio book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Alex. I, I actually would probably listen to the <laughs> audio book. I'm, still like it a bit. I'm, I'm so lazy with reading. <laughs> so. But there's an audio book and there's a Kindle as well if people like reading on Kindles. Dude, you should be so proud Thank of yourself because you. it's 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 uh, facing opposition and what you do. In the, it's very hard to. I live an easy breezy life. I sit there and I can sit on fences and I make sweets and yeah, all those kind of things. You actually have to go into sort of opposition most days and you have to wake up and 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 plead your point of view right and, and and express why it's better to live your lifestyle than others and how you want to get rid of suffering and i and you know i, I totally i agree with you in so many ways i really do um you also have a youtube channel i do don't you um yeah i have a youtube instagram uh facebook yeah earthling ad you know that go and follow it handle. guys honestly it, it, even if even if you even if you aren't vegan or you're just i just it's so good to have those point of views in your life Dude, I really appreciate it that you came on. That is so kind of you. Now, what we like to do at the end of the podcast is leave our listeners with something inspirational. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, good. That's, That's for you. That, yeah. That's for me. Okay, this is where I come into it. Um, well, th thanks for having me, by the way. Dude, of um, course. For inviting me. It was a pleasure to meet you both. Um, something inspirational. 
I think that we all have to recognize that as individuals, we have uh, the power to create significant change. You know, we live in a society where we sometimes think that we don't have influence. We look at things that happen around the world. We look at, you know, things that happen with our climate and we feel very helpless. But I think what we have to come to recognize is that we have a huge amount of power as individuals to create a huge shift. You know, every movement that's ever existed, everything that's ever happened positively for our history has happened because individuals came together mm. and created a mass movement that formed change. But all those mass movements were formed of individuals like like us, like the listeners, who thought, you know what, I want to be a part of something that changes them, you know, this for the better. And, you know, I think that we just have to recognize our capacity to to be that individual, to be that drop in the ocean of change, because every drop is as important as the, every other drop. So I think we just have to recognize that within ourselves and go, what sort of world do I want to exist in? And how can I help create that world myself? Ed, thank you so much. Thanks, Everybody, we'll see you, you next Nick. week. Bye-bye! <laughs> <laughs>